When the YLT SIG team invited me to be a speaker for the 35 year Emerald Anniversary Conference in the Inspire Strand, my first thought was that they had the wrong person. That self doubt is one of the problems that I'm going to tackle in my presentation today. I hope that in this session, I can share with you some of the problems that I've tried to fix during the course of my career and what I have done to try and fix them. My name is Jo Hayes and I'm the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Hong Kong, an international housing nonprofit organization. My story coincidentally spans 35, 35 years and will take us back to my maths classroom. But first, let's start with what instigated this self-reflection on my tug of war relationship with maths. At Habitat, we have a vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And I have a personal responsibility to be the best that I can be to navigate what has been an extremely challenging time for nonprofits. With my team and board of directors, we have weathered the storm, but I became tired of second guessing every decision that I was making. And I've had to make a lot of difficult decisions every single day. So I decided to apply to do an MBA. I was very particular about which program I wanted to apply to. And I wanted one that put data at the core. Some of them skip through the theory and focus on the practical experience. But at this stage of my life, I've had the privilege of many years of practical experience. So I want to know the theory and the data behind the decisions that I've been making every day. The problem, however, with identifying a data heavy MBA is that you need to have a solid foundation of maths, not just to do it, but to get onto it in the first place. I applied to Chicago Booth with the assumption that I wouldn't get a place. And I put in every spare moment into studying for the executive assessment that you have to take and pass to be part uh, as part of the application process. And for some, it's a simple school algebra, but for me, it brought up my deep rooted maths anxieties. I bought all the books, watched all the YouTube videos. I paid for all of the online suite of preparation materials and I shut myself off over the winter holidays to study. When the results came through, I had got the required 150 marks, but only just. And I had a very low score in the quant section. That's the maths. The admission team said that the rest of my application was good and I did really well in the interviews, but that I wouldn't get a place if I couldn't show that I had a high enough level of maths to cope with the maths on the MBA. And after months of studying and years of saying to myself that I was rubbish at maths, I decided that this was the end of my MBA dream and contacted the admissions office to say that I was going to withdraw my application for that year. They estimate you need around 30 hours to prepare for this um, executive assessment. And I had already spent many more hours than 30. Um, but I convinced myself that I needed another year if I was ever to get a better score than the one that I got first time around. I also knew going into this process that I didn't have the money to pay for an MBA. And the only way that I could actually take it, even if I did get a place, was with a scholarship. The admissions manager asked me to take a moment to think about it before my final decision. So I did. And here's what I thought about. I started by thinking about math lessons at school. Having been a teacher myself, I know how much energy and work goes into creating engagement uh, with your students, creating that content that will connect with them. And even when it's a subject that is not their favorite and um, that they go away having enjoyed and learned something from that experience. Maths was not my favorite subject at school, in fact, it was my least favorite subject. 
sitting in my maths class with a desk, um, not quite as modern as this one, my self-doubt and hatred of maths started to grow. We started our exercise at page one, exercise one, and we worked our way through the exercises until we got to an equation that we didn't understand. There was no real engagement with algebra and, and why it might be relevant to everyday life. It was abstract. And the maths teachers I had didn't engage with the students or the topic. They didn't inspire. Every time we had a question, we had to queue on one side of the teacher's desk, wait to be seen, wait to have our question answered, and then go back around the other side and sit back down until we came to our next question. That is my vivid memory of maths at school. When I started my GCSEs, I asked my teacher if I could move to a lower set. We had sets at the time. I didn't want to fail. The numbers were swirling around in my head. I couldn't connect with them, but I had a reputation for being a hard worker. I wasn't a cool kid, so I ended up staying in the class with the queuing and the silent working. I found respite in, my, in the classrooms where the teachers truly engaged us as learners. In my French class, the teachers inspired us to not only learn the language, but love the country. This made sitting at my desk, looking at numbers that I didn't understand and spending most of my time in a queue even more demotivating. Many years later, when visiting a friend in Chicago, I was chatting about maths and my painful memories when he introduced me to Professor Pai and sowed seeds that maybe the numbers weren't so scary after all. We talked for an hour about his maths teacher who every single lesson would tell a story. And the hero of that story, Professor Pai. Prof Professor Pai and his mates would go on exciting adventures whilst they navigated mathematical equations and they went to the cinema and ate pizza in the process. His students were gripped to every single word. Hearing about this inspirational teacher triggered a footnote in my brain that the day that I thought I wasn't inspiring the students in my class would be the day that I moved on to something new. That day came a few years later when I heard myself saying, turn to page five, go to exercise three and come and see me if you have a question. So why is the subject of math still so important to me now? Well, since I left the classroom many, many moons ago, I've worked in roles and industries where I've had to manage budgets and I've had to come to grips with complex calculations and Excel tables. But the self-doubt in my abilities has persisted all the way through. Influenced by the teachers who taught me, I've also held on to this ingrained belief that I don't like maths. But I'm now running an organization and whilst I have finance experts around me, both in my team and on the board of directors, I have a responsibility to have a deep understanding of the numbers so that I can make informed decisions. Last year, I decided to face my fear of the subject head on and expand my comfort zone. And I enrolled in a six week, very intensive managerial finance program. It was challenging to be back in the classroom, but the approach to learning has obviously dramatically evolved since my maths classroom days. And I joined a team of globally dispersed students. Every Sunday we talked for a couple of hours about the finance issues that we had to solve. I loved it, I loved the challenge. I love the process of navigating a complex equation and finding the answer. And I particularly loved how I could make that direct connection between the numbers on the page and the real life situations that I have to navigate every day. But it still wasn't enough to bring my quant score up where it needed to be for the MBA application. This session today is not very long. So on the topic of marriage, I'm not even scratching the surface of problems and whether I fix them or not. But I will share, however, what the connection is between marriage and maths and why the root cause of my problem with maths, the self-doubt and the dislike for the subject 
was heavily influenced by others and is inextricably linked by marriage. My two children from my first marriage are the best thing that's ever happened to me. And they're much older than they are in this photo. So to them, I say, as they're watching this, that not everything was a problem with my first marriage. But there was a black hole. I was so inspired by my French teachers that I decided to move to France and marry a Frenchman. I was very quickly convinced that whilst I'd studied French at university and I was now living in France, that my maths wasn't good enough to manage the household finances in French. To be fair, I still believed I didn't like maths. And when my husband would try to explain maths to me, it was in French. And he was very, very capable at mental arithmetic and verbalizing a maths problem. But I needed to see it written down. And frustrations were kick, quick to come from both sides when I remember doing calculations differently when I was at school. And I simply couldn't understand what he considered to be basic maths. Any confidence I might have retained, I didn't hold on to for long. And by the time we separated in 2009, I had no control over our finances and was left with an empty bank account. I then had to rebuild my life from scratch. But I did come out of the black hole. My second husband is my biggest supporter. And this is him over here. Uh, volunteering at one of the Habitat service days. His you can do it voice is more constant and so much louder than my inner voice telling me that I can't. Every single day he sends me messages and reminds me that I'm capable and clever and he helps to drown out the inner voice and self-doubt every time it comes back and it does come back often. After two years of thinking that I was losing my mind and having no idea what was happening to me, I'm still, I'm still a very long way off from having fixed this particular problem. Two years ago, I didn't even know what the word perimenopause was. But what has this got to do with maths? And why have I been thinking about the perimenopause as I reflect on the ABA, MBA application? I joined Habitat in 2018, and after a few months, someone in my team remarked that I would often say, there are two things that we need to consider. There are two challenges here. There are two things that I'd like to highlight today. I always started my sentences with, there are two things. And it has become something now that the team expects from me. But it took me a long time to realize that I'd started counting to two on my fingers as a strategy to try and remember what I wanted to say. I was losing my memory. Then one day in early 2021, after my disappointing exam result, I was sitting with my management team to go through the three organizational strategies for the year ahead. I lifted my fingers not to count from one to two, but from one to three. But by the time I got to number three, my mind went blank and there was nothing. It was totally empty. And it's not like when you have something on the tip of your tongue, it was empty. My self-doubt was at its greatest. And I started to believe that I was not just rubbish at maths, but that I was just rubbish. And that's when I made an appointment to see a doctor. Brain fog is one of a very, very long list of perimenopausal symptoms. It's hormonal. It's not about ability or skill sets, but it all adds to your inner voice telling you that you're not good enough. And it allows your self-doubt to dominate. It certainly did for me. I've been in a black hole once in my life before, and I was aware that my mind was starting to spiral. Maybe I was overthinking, but I got to a place where I felt overwhelmed by the slightest situation. 
One of the other many symptoms that women suffer with during the menopause is a new intolerance to certain foods. After two years of a dodgy gut, I heard about a DNA test that is less focused on ancestry and more focused on nutrition. It also uses some of the world's most advanced testing technology that boasts a 99.9% .9 analytical accuracy. I'm all about the data now, so this was the one for me. And the results were for the most part informative and expected. I need to eat different foods and do more exercise. And I need to reset my gut as an important first step for getting my mind back on track. What was unexpected was the detailed reporting on personality and skill sets. My husband and I were eagerly reading our respective reports and comparing as we went through the findings one by one. When we got to the mathematical skills and my test stated, as you can see right here, gifted, my husband didn't smirk or laugh out loud at such an outrageous idea. He simply nodded and said, you see? More importantly, it gave me an immediate boost of confidence. It was the mind shifts, mindset shift that I needed to finally start believing in myself, at least when it came to maths. The DNA tests and the accompanying notes and instructions on how to, to read the results helped me to realize that maybe I wasn't fundamentally rubbish at maths and that nurture had something to answer for. So I picked up the phone to the admissions team and having had this boost of a semi-scientific confirmation of my hidden maths warrior, I asked a friend to teach me basic maths again. His, patient, his patience and non-judgmental teaching gave me the extra confidence I needed. A few months later, I retook the test. And whilst you can see that I only got one more point than I did before, the big reveal, I doubled <laughs> my quant score and I was accepted onto the program. At the time of speaking, I don't know if I'll ever be able to financially take up my spot. There were two scholarships and I was in the final three. I've deferred my application to next year, but this time with the confidence that I can do it. Through this process, I have learned that whilst I might not be a math genius, I'm definitely not rubbish at it. So, what are the two things that I'd like to leave you with today? Number one, comfort zone. I used to be afraid of water. This is me here taking part in an outrigging race and getting into a boat like this was my way of facing my fear of water and expanding my comfort zone. I no longer think of my comfort zone as something I need to step out of. I think of every new learning opportunity and every new challenge as a way for me to expand my comfort zone and make it bigger than it was the day before. It makes saying yes easier and it makes scary situations less scary. And number two, when somebody around you says that you're rubbish at something or when your inner voice is screaming at you to not bother as you probably can't do it anyway shut out the noise and rewrite the script this picture is from my first week with habitat i was in nepal building houses and i was working alongside families who had lost their homes in the 2015 earthquake the tape you can see here read men at work, but that didn't sit well with me at all, especially as Habitat had trained local women as masons. So I was being shown how to lay the foundations of a house by a group of phenomenal women home builders. So I picked up a couple of pens and we changed the language. We changed the script. I know I'm not a math genius, but I'm not rubbish at it either. And it's no longer a subject that I fear 
or will hate. And the next time you tell yourself that you're rubbish at something, find someone to be your biggest supporter and remember that the root cause of the problem might not be your abilities or your skill sets. It might simply be the script your inner voice is telling you. So go get an inner pen and change it. Thank you.